Good morning. I might speak to you in an alternate reality if I think you're perceptive enough to understand it. I first started doing this when I was going to the University of Utah when I was I was 20 years old and I had uh, been keeping a lot of family secrets. I hadn't told anyone. I hadn't told any members of my family, my sisters. They were younger. I didn't think they could handle such things. They were about molesters and what that had to do with family members. Uh, so, but I decided in my senior year that I was getting very unhealthy. I'd already developed chronic fatigue and, and even thought I was going to die. I thought I might have leukemia, uh, rheumatic fever, bad heart. I didn't know what. So I decided that I had to get help. I had to. Before leaving the University of Utah, I needed to make an attempt, a, a determined attempt, to tell people there. And so I wrote the paper to my professor at the time, head of the department of theater, and I wrote that students were often covered with sores all over, and others would treat them just like they were normal, don't pay any attention to these sores, just ignore them. Well, my the professor himself was suffering, I knew, from some health issues and was thinking about retiring. So he was probably too ill, too distracted to pay attention to this message I was sending to him. I didn't see how I could have sent a bigger call for help. He said, I can't grade this paper. You know, it wasn't written in the manner that he'd asked for. <laughs> I took the paper back. I didn't offer to rewrite it. I thought, well, if you want to give me a failing grade on this paper, go ahead. So we didn't say any more, and he gave me, I think, a passing grade in that class, B. And I thought, oh, <sighs> well, what am I going to do now? Well, finally, I decided after thinking about it, I just wasn't going to get any help at this university. I, if I wasn't, what was the use of even going on? I was probably too ill already from stress, from to teach. I had nearly died from a tonsillectomy while I was in the hospital. I went into shock. Uh, that was another warning. You're not well. So I thought, well, I can't get any help here. I just well leave the university. And this was after, so I thought, well, before I leave, I am going to let these people know that something is amiss. And so I started using this uh, silence, a few moments of silence unusual, unusual silence. Like I was in a class for teaching, learning to teach English to high school students. And I just thought, well, I don't, I'm not, I'm leaving the university, so I would just answer the questions any way I wanted to. I expressed my inner self, my inner troubled self. Well, I hadn't done that in classes before. So she uh, didn't understand what the answer she was getting. 
and and then I didn't take any notes. I just sat and looked at her while everybody else was scribbling down notes. Not me. And she finally said, called me in after class, and she said, to my great surprise, if you will not come to class, I will give you the credit for it. What? She said, I can't teach with you sitting there looking at me. I said, oh, well. I said, don't worry about it. I won't come, but I'm leaving university anyway. So, doesn't matter. And then the next day, I just didn't show up to a midterm. Now, that would sure fix it. I was on my way out of college. And the only thing that was preventing me from leaving right then was I was in a play. I was on the road. It was a children's play. And in it, I was playing this sweet Amish girl who was so nice, so obedient. And I thought, oh, my professor must be giving me a message of how he wants me to act. But I'm not going to let him down. I will go. And during her line rehearsal, they told me that I just went to sleep. I hated those line rehearsals in the car. He didn't want you to put any emotion into it, so it's just dreary. Uh, 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 you know, you're going over your lines. And the professor, um, everybody, they said, tried to wake me up. I wouldn't wake up. Well, I thought, another sign, another sign that I'm not well. <laughs> And so eventually, this got to the, the professor. And so he made another attempt to talk to me. And when he made the appointment, he didn't show up. And finally the secretary said, well, I don't know what's happened to him. He must have got tied up uh, probably with, uh, you know, a conference with a famous, Broadway star or somebody like that because he had a lot to do with Broadway and Hollywood stars uh, in the plays. They would come and act in a play every year. So, And so I said, to, I thought to myself, well, Hollywood star is a lot more important than this student. So when he did show up to the next appointment, he started asking me, well, what are your problems? And I just sat there. I didn't answer. Silence had now become my foremost expression to this professor who just ignored my call for help. And he, of course, he was so harried. He said, well, all right, if you won't talk to me, would you go over and talk to the school psychiatrist. And I said, I suppose. And so I thought to myself, well, I'll give him a whirl. He probably needs to be woke up too. And I'll go over there and give him the treatment. Silence. And, you know, I didn't think a thing of it. I had never been to a school psychiatrist before. In spite of my, uh, I think when I was a freshman, I said that I'd had a nervous breakdown on something. And they brought me in for one visit. That was when I was a freshman, of course, and I wasn't desperate then. And I didn't answer or say anything. So... After I got into the psychiatrist's office, I didn't like his frivolous attitude. He just acted like, oh, another student who has their little troubles. And so I thought, I'll just give him a dose of silence. Maybe he asked me a question. I just, it did take a lot of nerve to do this. I just looked at him right in the eye. I didn't answer. He asked me another. I didn't answer that. 
And he asked, asked, asked another just ordinary question. I didn't answer that. I just looked him right in the eyes and I thought, I wonder if you understand I'm looking into your soul. <laughs> well, he got up and left the room. And I thought to myself, oh my word, where is he gone? Well, he's not paying any attention either. I, I guess I should just get up, walk out of here. Uh, but of course, I've still got that play I have to be in. So I can't leave right at the moment. Daddy is probably going, to, oh, what he's going to do to me when I arrive home and say, well, I've quit college. He's going to think I've gone completely crazy. <laughs> and so I just got up, ready to move. And here come the professor back, oh, the psychiatrist back. And he looked at me and he said, Geraldine, I think you need to go to a hospital. Hospital? Uh-oh. What have I done now? <gasps> I said, oh, 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 no, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I can't go to a hospital. I'm in a play. I have to go this weekend. It's the third, uh, second week. Uh, I need to be there. He looked at me and said, Geraldine, you are going to the hospital. Oh, I, and I was desperate. I, I said, uh, therapy, I'll, I'll take therapy, but I can't go to the hospital. Just then, a man with a gun came into the room. And I thought, uh-oh. I, I, well, without another word from the psychiatrist, the man with the gun took charge of me and committed me, committed me to a psych ward. Oh, here I am. And what is more, I was told by the intern who got in charge of my case, that I would receive electric shock therapy. <gasps> oh, this was very bad news because I had chronic fatigue. In fact, I felt myself going into a bout of it right at the moment. I didn't sleep. And I said, but I can't have, I, I can't have chronic, I can't have uh, electric shock therapy. And they said, you have no choice. If you're prescribed electric shock therapy, you will get electric shock therapy. I, I said, I can't refuse it? No. But it might. Well, they said I suggest, uh, they suggested that I ask for an interview if I didn't think that uh, I could survive electric shock therapy. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and I, I just thought, oh my God. If I let them give me electric shock therapy, I may not come out of it. They don't know how sick I've been. They don't know how many near, how I thought I was gonna die for days. I didn't even tell my mother and dad. I don't tell anybody anything. And I didn't sleep that night all night. And I didn't sleep all night the next night. And when I finally got to talk to the head of the psychiatric department in the whole medical school, Dr. Branch, who was in charge of my case, I told him, I can't have electric shock. I don't think I could survive it. And I told him all the reasons why as much as I could. 20 minutes he gave me. I said this, that, the other. Mm -mm. I was trying to save my life, my life. And he said, nodded, and that was it. Well, five days I had not slept. My mother and dad came to see me. I couldn't talk to them. I turned my head to the wall. I had to save my life. I could not talk to my mother and dad wanting me to tell them what happened, that I was still okay. I wasn't okay. If I didn't stop them from giving me electric shock treatment, I'd be dead, dead, I'm sure of it. So 
So I turned my head to the wall and my mother was going to give me a good slap, make me talk, and my dad was there. They left, and then I figured out the only way I could save myself, really, if that psychiatrist did not, was he going to listen to a 20-year-old? Everybody in there, I found out, was getting electric shock treatment. I was going to get it. I, unless... I couldn't trust the less. So finally in the day room, I thought of a plan. I slowed my breathing down. I simply did not take a deeper breath. And pretty soon I was semi-conscious and I thought to myself, when they see me like this, they are not going to dare to give me electric shock because they'll know I will probably die. Well, for four hours, my breathing, I kept it like that. I set it, and for four hours, it hurt, it hurt. It was like, it was dying, but I was dying to keep them from giving me shock, which I felt would instantly kill me. After four hours, I quit breathing. I was semi-conscious. They came running in when I went into the, the breathing that happens when you quit breathing. They said they didn't notice that I would quit breathing because they weren't used to a patient doing this. So they left and I was like, well, I've got to start breathing now, for sure, or else. And I just sat up. They came in, said, do you want dinner? I said, yes. And I found out later that it was called a catatonic seizure because it was like under my control. And within a very short time, the intern secured a paper that said I could go home without treatment if I signed that paper that I voluntarily committed myself. I said, that's a lie. Sign it, sign it, he said. The intern had sat by my bed for two hours. He was afraid if I didn't sign that paper. And I got electric shock, I would die, and I, thought I would too, so I signed the paper. And they said, well, they wanted to keep me for a couple of weeks to make sure I was okay. Okay, I said. And so that's how you get help at a university. <laughs> when you need it. <laughs> oh boy, so when I speak to you with silence, I'm just using my alternate reality. When all else fails, 